Hey, welcome back. The Bandgap references are amongst the most popular reference voltage circuits which are omnipresent in ICs. By reference voltage, I mean a voltage that is stable with process and temperature variations and also which is unaffected by supply noise. In today's video, let's dive deeper into the underlying principle of most Bandgap circuits. A quick disclaimer that this video is just meant to give a bird's eye view into the core principle and not discuss the nitty gritty in detail. For a more detailed study, please refer to the lecture by Professor Ali Hajimiri from Caltech or to the lecture by Dr. Ashwin from IIT Kanpur who taught this to me. Okay, without any further ado, let's dive right into the core principle of band gap references. When you hear the terms band gap references, you, you would most likely also hear PTAT and CTAT along with it. PTAT stands for proportional to absolute temperature, whereas CTAT stands for complementary to absolute temperature. The key idea behind the band gap reference is that we generate a PTAT voltage which increases linearly with temperature. Next, we generate a CTAT voltage which varies inversely with temperature. Then we try to combine them in such a way that the temperature dependence cancels out. Sounds fairly simple until now. But how do we generate these voltages? First, let's think of a relatively stable voltage that we are already familiar with. We know that the forward bias drop of a silicon diode is typically around 0.6 to 0.7 volts, which we can easily obtain from the base emitter voltage of a BJT by pushing a current into it. However, that varies with several factors including temperature. Let's see how. We know that the collector current can be expressed as IC equals to IS times exponential VBE by VT, neglecting the one since I'm assuming a forward bias operation. Manipulating this expression, we get VEB equals to VT ln IC over IS, where VT is the thermal voltage and is expressed as KBT over Q. So for a fixed IC, does VEB exhibit a PTAT behavior? Well, no, we also have an IS term, which is the saturation current. Those of you who might have done solid state devices course would have recognized that IS depends on NI square, where NI is the intrinsic carrier concentration and also the electron and hole mobilities in silicon, which have a temperature dependence. I encourage you to look at the temperature dependence of Ni and electron mobility with temperature. Cutting out that part of the algebra, the point is that Is can be expressed as some constant K times exponential minus Vbg by Vt, where Vbg is the band gap voltage of silicon. Plugging that in, we have Veb equals to Vt ln I over K plus Vbg. Differentiating this equation with respect to T to find the variation of VEB with temperature, we get dVB by dT equals to dVBG by dV dT plus KB over Q times ln I by K. The temperature dependence of the band gap voltage can be computed as per the Vashni model. However, that dependence is fairly weak. It goes something like VBG at a particular temperature T is equal to VBG at the temperature of 0 Kelvin minus alpha T square over beta plus T and would vary by about 50 millivolts from room temperature to 0 Kelvin. Let's just ignore that for now since it doesn't significantly change the underlying concept. Therefore, dVEB by dT equals to VEB minus VBG over T. Plugging in typical values of VEB and VBG, which is about 0.6 to 0.7 volts and 1.12 volts respectively, we can get a slope of about minus 1.6 millivolt per Kelvin. Great, we now have a CTAT voltage. But how do we generate a PTAT voltage? Well, we can extend the above methodology to do so. Let's say we generate two VEB voltages, call it VB1 and VEB2. Now, now note that the CTAT behavior came from the IS term. Otherwise, we even thought for a second that VEB had a PTAT dependence due to the prefactor of VT. So let's try to cancel that out by taking the difference of the two VEBs. 
Now, if we choose to have equal currents in both the BJTs, since that is simple to do via our current mirror, and we choose IS1 equals to N times IS2 by keeping N BJTs in parallel, since IS is proportional to the area, we will get delta VEB equals to VT ln N, which is clearly a PTAT voltage. N is typically chosen in such a way to get an adequate delta VEB and also to get a symmetric layout to cancel out the variations. For instance, N equals to 8 would help create a symmetric square kind of a layout because total in total we have 9 transistors and thus that would be a good choice. So now we have a CTAT and a PTAT voltage which can be intelligently added to generate a stable voltage reference. I won't discuss that how it is added to generate a stable voltage reference as it is out of the scope of this video. However, one question still remains unanswered. Why is it called a band gap reference? Why not just a voltage reference? Let's see why. Suppose we are able to generate an output voltage equal to VEB1 plus some constant beta times delta VEB where beta is used to cancel the temperature dependence. Next, if we want to find out the value of beta, we impose the condition that the output voltage should be independent of temperature, meaning that dV out by dt equals to zero. Plugging in the derivatives and equating to zero, we get the value of beta. Beta can be plugged back into the expression for V out to get V out equals to VBG, which is the band gap voltage. This is a fairly stable voltage reference and can be made even more stable by advanced techniques such as trimming. If you want me to discuss about trimming in a concise form, let me know in the comments below. By the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. And thanks for making it so far. See you in the next one. Peace.